Is God real? Are the stories in the Bible true? I need answers. Welcome to A Closer Look with the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. I'm Fred Jeff Smith, pastor of Shiloh, and I'm very happy that you chose to spend the next hour with us as we delve into the study of God's Word. We can't do what we don't know. Here at Shiloh, we want to spend time studying the Word so that we can rightly apply the Word to our daily living and make a difference in our community and in our world for Jesus Christ. Won't you join us now for a closer look into God's Word? We call your attention, please, to Isaiah chapter 61. And I want us to look at the first 11 verses. Isaiah chapter 61. We're de- we've been dealing for the last couple of weeks with Advent and the various themes of Advent. And this week we're dealing with the third of the Advent themes. There are only four, so we're, we, we have crossed the halfway point with today's Bible study. Uh, the first theme uh, had to do with hope. Uh, the second theme had to do with joy. Today's theme, I'm sorry, with peace. Today's theme has to do with joy. Uh, and, and so we're going to be talking about the transcendent joy that should be ours with the coming of Messiah. Now let me start with that because I, I put a descriptive on joy. I said it's transcendent. What do I mean by transcendent. Whenever I use that term, I'm speaking of that which is outside the normal realm of human time and space. One of the characteristics of God is his transcendence, Uh, the fact that God exists outside of time and space. In fact, according to our understanding of Scripture, time and space came into being by the call of God, by the charge of God. God spoke it into existence. And and so the fact that he spoke time and space into existence suggests that he existed before there was time and space. And that is what transcendent means. In a similar fashion, there are aspects of our relationship with God that are transcendent of our normal human experience. Uh, If we are Uh, indwelled and infilled by the Holy Spirit, then there are aspects of our relationship with God that are transcendent of human experience. You hear us talk about uh, uh, peace, which is what our theme was last week. And one of the points that we tried to make last week is that from a purely human perspective, peace is a myth. It, 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 It does not exist. How, how do you and I define peace, typically? It's not that hard. It's the absence of conflict. Now, if that's the definition, can we agree that that's the definition? Uh, okay, you, well, you, you ain't raised your hand, but you nodded your head. So, so it, it, if we can agree that, that that's the definition of peace, then tell me, when was there a time in your life when you have been completely free of conflict. At every stage of it, even as a baby, there was conflict. They didn't bring you the bottle fast enough. They didn't change you fast enough. Or or somebody dropped you and they weren't supposed to drop you. Babies cry for three reasons primarily. They they cry because they're wet. They cry because they're hungry. They cry because they are in pain. And what they want you to do is relieve the pain. So even in an infantile state, there was some kind of conflict going on. At every stage of your lives, you have been dealing with one form of conflict or another. Now, older people will tell younger people, you ain't got nothing to worry about. But you know why they say that? Because they're old, and and they've already been through what you are going through. When you're in that stage of life, it's as real to you as their problem is to them. So a toddler has conflict. A preteen has conflict. A teenager has conflict. And God, heaven knows, once you get into your 20s and, and they tell you it's time to get out of the house and, and you got to go find someplace else to live, well, well, then you got all kinds of conflict. 
conflict when, when you start dating folk. Conflict when, 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 the, when you break up with the one that you were dating. Conflict once you get married. Conflict about, oh God, talking with people about getting married. I, I know that's a conflict. There is always, in whatever's at middle age, there's a conflict. Retirement, there's a conflict. Old age, there's a conflict. I, I, I'm leaving this job. I'm tired. I'm dealing with all the mess. And then you got to deal with all the mess that you have to deal with at home that you've been putting off for 20 years because you were at work all the time. There is always a time of conflict. So by the, by the human definition of peace, a time without conflict, it does not exist. It simply does not exist exist. When you're young, you want to get old enough to do stuff. When you're old, you wish you were younger so that you could do it right. When, 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 when you're small, you want to be big enough to do stuff. When you get big, it, it, it's, I wish I, I didn't have to do this all the time. There is always a time of conflict. So from, from, from a human perspective, peace is a myth. But from a spiritual perspective, peace is readily available to you. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verses 26 and 27, peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you. And then he clarifies, not as the world gives, give I to you. And so from, from a spiritual perspective, peace transcends normal human circumstances. And as that is true about peace, I just spent five minutes talking about peace, which was last week's theme. As that is true about peace, it is also true about joy. Joy is not happiness. And happiness is not joy. Happiness has to do with circumstances. You can be happy this minute and unhappy the next minute. And five minutes from now, you can be happy all over again because circumstances shift and they shift quickly. They, they, they shift with, 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 with uncertainty. You never know which circumstance you're going to deal with. Is there anybody else besides me who has awakened in the morning feeling pretty good only to turn on the TV or pick up the newspaper or get a phone call and realize I ain't feeling so good anymore. And now you're all messed up because of what was shared with you. But then 30 minutes later, something else happens and it relieves all of the stress that you had before. It shifts like, 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 like a breeze blowing uh, 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 blades of grass. It shifts. It goes from one degree to another. Happiness has never been the goal of the church or of Christ. But joy is the goal. And joy differs from happiness in that why, whereas happiness depends on circumstances, joy extends beyond circumstances. I can be unhappy and still have joy because my joy is rooted in my relationship with God. And as long as I have that relationship with God, I can still have joy. Turn in your Bibles for a second. I know I said Isaiah, but turn in your Bibles for a second to Habakkuk. Look at verse 17. And I'm reading from the message version. Habakkuk chapter 3, beginning with verse 17. Though. I really ain't got to go no further than though. Though the fig tree or the cherry trees don't blossom and the strawberries don't ripen. Though the apples are worm-eaten and the wheat fields stunted. Though the sheep pens are sheepless and the cattle barns empty. 
I'm singing joyful praise to God. I'm turning cartwheels of joy to my Savior, God. Counting on God's rule to prevail, I take heart and gain strength. I run like a deer. I feel like I'm king of the mountain. That's joy. That though, though, and then everything that comes after that, though the bottom has fallen out, though I'm experiencing collapse from one end of my life to another, I still have joy. It tells us that, 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 that from a human standpoint, happiness can be estranged from us. But from a spiritual standpoint, we can still have joy. Does not Job say the same thing? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him? It is, it, it is a transcendent confidence that we have rooted not in any human circumstance, but in our relationship with God. And that's what the theme, that's what this third theme of Advent is. Because of the coming of God's Messiah, we can have joy regardless of our circumstances. So let's read Isaiah chapter 61, beginning with verse 1. And I'm reading from the message version. The Spirit of God, the Master, is on me because God anointed me. He sent me to preach good news to the poor, heal the heartbroken, announce freedom to all captives, Pardon all prisoners. God sent me to announce the year of his grace, a celebration of God's destruction of our enemies, and to comfort all who mourn, to care for the needs of all who mourn in Zion. Give them bouquets of roses instead of ashes, messages of joy instead of news of doom, a praising heart instead of a languid spirit. Rename them oaks of righteousness planted by God to display his glory. They'll rebuild the old ruins, raise a new city out of the wreckage. They'll start over on the ruined cities, take the rubble left behind and make it new. Now, for even the casual Bible reader, the first couple of verses of Isaiah chapter 61 ought to sound strangely familiar to you. You know why? I'm going to help you with why. No, Reverend, I don't know why. Tell me why. Turn to Luke chapter 4. beginning with verse 16. He came to Nazareth, he being Jesus, where he had been reared, as he always did on the Sabbath. He went to the meeting place. When he stood up to read, he was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, God's Spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor, sent me to announce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burdened and battered free, to announce this is God's year to act. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the assistant, and sat down. 
Every eye in the place was on him intent. Then he started in. You've just heard scripture make history. It came true just now in this place. The words that Jesus recited are from this very passage of Isaiah chapter 61. And Jesus used these words to set forth the purpose of his coming. Now, remember what we have told you Advent means. Advent means the celebration of the coming of God's Messiah. Well, if God sent his Messiah, the logical question would be, for what purpose was he sent? And Jesus answers the question for us by saying that I was sent to fulfill what God said to us through the prophet Isaiah. Now, in some cases, we, we, we say this all the time, whenever we're talking about prophetic writing, in some cases we, we, we remind people that prophecy has a twofold meaning that there is a, a meaning for the immediate audience and that there, is a meaning, that there is a meaning for future generations. And, and we try to be respectful of the meaning for the immediate audience because uh, it makes no sense for us to say that a prophetic writing uh, only has meaning 400, 500, in, in the case of Isaiah, 700 years after it was given. Seven centuries later, we know it refers to Jesus, but there had to be a meaning before that because if that were not the case, then those who were hearing the message get no benefit from the message. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? I feel like I, I lost you somewhere. But, but, but there is always a twofold meaning, and we always try to be respectful of the immediate meaning of the passage. But in this case, we don't have to be respectful of it because ultimately it does not matter. For example, where, where, where going back to Isaiah, where, where it says, uh, for, for to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We are mindful to say that while we know through hindsight that ultimately that was talking about Jesus, we don't know who the passage was talking about in the time in which it was given. We don't know what child this was. We don't know uh, uh, who this person is. Some people like to speculate about who the child was. Some would say that it was a future king of Israel. Some would actually try to be specific and say that it was King Josiah, who was recognized as the last righteous king that Judah had. And so we spend some time trying to, 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 to look back and speculate as to who the passage was referring to in that time, in the immediate time in which it was given. We don't have to do that with this because Jesus makes it very clear that regardless of who it was about then, it's about me now. It's solely and completely about me. And you know how I know that? Because after he read it, he sat down and said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, this scripture has made history. This text is all about me. Now, that's helpful to us for a couple of reasons, a couple of reasons that immediately come to my mind. The first one is it's helpful because it reminds us that all of God's promises are good. There is never a promise that God has made. There's never a promise that God has not revealed to us in Scripture that he does not ultimately fulfill. Sometimes it takes a long, long time. And sometimes we get tired of waiting for the fulfillment to come. 
At least you're honest about it. You said amen when I said you get tired of waiting. Can, can I tell you what happens when we get, well, I shouldn't say it, it happens like it's automatic. Can I tell you the danger of getting tired of waiting on God? You make mistakes. Genesis chapter 11, where God calls Abram out of his father's house, and, and, and God makes a promise to Abram that he was going to have seed and that the seed was going to be as numerous as stars in the heavens, as numerous as grains of sand on uh, the, the, the beach, that, that, that there would be no way to count them, and that from his seed, all nations on earth would be blessed. Abram had a problem. He was old, his wife was old, and they ain't have no children. And, 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 and he, he, he was faithful to start with. God said, move. He moved. Next morning, God spoke to him on a, what is today, Wednesday? God spoke to him on a Wednesday night, on Thursday morning. Abram was out. Daddy, I'm gone. Where you going? I don't know. I'm going wherever God sends me. How long are you going to be gone? Until God tells me to come back, I'm gone. And, 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 and the scripture says, everywhere he went, he, he, he built an altar and he worshiped the Lord. And that went on for a good while. He made a couple of mess ups along the way, had to go down into Egypt and, and lied and said that, 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 that my wife ain't my wife, she's actually my sister. Got in trouble down there with that. But guess what? He came out of Egypt richer than he was when he went in. Kind of strange. I got some questions I got to ask God when I finally get to, 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 to heaven. But, but, but Abram, you know, we always tell folk about how lying is such a terrible thing. Abram lied. And he came out of Egypt richer than he was when he went in. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Well, it also can make you money because he came out richer then he was, he ain't the only one who lied. Rahab lied. Ra Ra Rahab was was, 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 was was housing the spies and, and folk came looking for the spies and, and Rahab said they went that away. And they were right underneath her skirt. And, 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 and when they went off that way, Rahab said, now y'all remember what I did. And Rahab was blessed because of the lie that she told. You go back and read Jesus' genealogy. You know whose name appears in Jesus' genealogy? Rahab the harlot. Y'all got to rethink that, that lying thing a little bit. Uh, I'm just saying, I, I, I ain't said nothing but what the Scripture says. Abram trusted God, waited on God, believed God, waited on the promise to happen. And after a while, Abram got tired of waiting. And Abram and, and Sarah decided that they were going to help God out. Do you know how dangerous it is when you think you're going to help God out in a way that God has not asked you to help him. Yes, God wants our help. God wants our participation, but God wants our participation in the way that God asks us to participate. God does not want our unsolicited counsel, assistance, or advice. Abram and, and Sarah said, well, we're going to take this boy Elimelech, and we're going to make him our foster child. And, 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 and he'll become the seed through which uh, this, this estate uh, will happen. God said, I ain't tell you nothing about no foster child. I ain't tell you nothing about no adopted child. I told you that from your seed it's going to happen. So they, wait, they waited a little while longer. And, and, and then Sarah said, I'm too old. He, he, he promised it, but, but, but I'm too old. 
So, so I tell you what I want you to do. I want you to take my maidservant there. Uh, take, take, take Hagar and make a baby with Hagar. And the baby that you make with Hagar will be our child. She'll be the surrogate. And, and, and the baby that you make with Hagar will be our child. And Abram ain't asked no questions. He said, okay, baby, I, I'll do exactly what you want me to do. Problem was they didn't talk to God about it. And when God finally did get around to talking to him about it, God said, I ain't ask you to do anything to help me. I told you that from your seed with Sarah, you will bless the nations. Now, my point is this. Yes, ma'am, I see your hand. My point is this. Be careful about doubting God because it takes a long time for some of these promises to come about. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, it, it, and we always, we, wasn't it Henry Ford, before commercials used to be, Ford has a better idea. That, that's part of our problem. We all think we're Henry Ford. We all think we, we, we got a better idea. We all think we're Burger King. We're going to have it our way. Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce, special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us have it. Your way? Y'all don't remember that commercial? Maybe I ate too many Whoppers as a child. I don't know. But, but, but part of our problem is that we have a lack of patience when it comes to the promises of God. But this scripture tells us that God will keep his promise. Second thing the scripture tells us is that God establishes his purpose through willing and obedient servants. If you want to know what, what, what's problematic for the church in the 21st century, and, and I got a long list. One day I'll share it with you. But, but, but among the things that are problematic with the early church is the simple fact that we don't want to be obedient to what God has called us to do. Instead, we want to do what we want to do, and then we want God to bless it. God has established his church to do certain things. God has established his church to give certain messages. Read what the passage says. The Spirit of God, <clears throat> the Master, is on me because God anointed me. Anointing means that God has set you apart. That, 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 that's what the anointing means, that God has set you apart. What has he set you apart to do? Passage tells you, he sent me to preach good news to the poor. Let's start with preach, proclaim. Okay, because somebody's gonna say, well, I wasn't called to be a preacher. You were called to proclaim. You don't have to be set apart as a part of the preaching ministry of Christ in order to be a proclaimer. You want to know the first ones who proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus? The women named Mary. Mary, Mary, and, and, and what, what was the other one's name? Salome. According to Matthew, there, there were three of them who were there. But, but Mary Magdalene was the first one to go back and proclaim that, that, that and, and, and there was never anything that said that Mary Magdalene had a preaching ministry call on her life, and that is not to say that I have a problem with women preachers. Obviously, I do not. But this idea that proclamation belongs only to the preaching academy is wrong. Every disciple of Jesus ought to be a proclaimer. 
And, 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 and that's the first purpose. That's, that's why the church was established. That is what we have been called to do, to proclaim. Proclaim what? The good news. And what is the good news? Jesus is the good news. In, in all of his person, Jesus is the good news. And so the purpose of the church is to proclaim Jesus. To who? To the poor. Well, now, who's the poor? Everybody. He ain't, he ain't talking about economically poor. He's talking about spiritually poor. And anyone who doesn't have Christ is spiritually poor. And so our responsibility, our purpose, if we are obedient, is to proclaim Jesus to the poor. So a church that proclaims but doesn't proclaim Jesus, I got a problem with. And many of our churches today proclaim all kinds of stuff that ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. Many of our churches today spend a whole lot of time talking about a bloodless, crossless, sufferless Christianity. And can I tell you that such a thing does not exist? At some point, you got to say he was wounded for our transgression. And he was bruised for our iniquity. At some point, you have to say they hung him high and they stretched him wide. At some point, you have to say that they pressed a crown of thorns into his skull. At some point, you have to say they pierced him in his side until blood and water came out. At some point, you have to say he died on a Friday and rose early on a Sunday morning. And, 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 and you can talk about prosperity. You can talk about economic advantage and you can talk about home life and you can talk about how to have a happy marriage and you can talk about the spiritual way to raise your children you can do all that kind of stuff but if you leave out and, and don't misunderstand me if you're speaking that as a supplement or as an addition to the gospel i ain't got no problem with it but when it becomes a substitute for the gospel I got a problem with it. I got a problem with praise music that ain't nothing but capitalism set, set to a tune. Me, me, me. Me, 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 me. Me, 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 and every now and then, my. That, that, and that's all we talk about. I got a problem with paranoid preaching. You got haters out there, all your haters out there. Your, your, your haters are trying to destroy you. Don't you know most of the folk ain't studying about you? They, they, they ain't even thinking about you. you. You got in your mind that the whole world hates you. And folk ain't thinking about you. Don't know your name. There's a movie I watched years ago where this girl was trying to get revenge on a guy who did something to her father years ago, and she tells him all of the terrible things that he did to her father and how she had hated him all through the years because of what he did to her father. And the guy looked at her, and he said, all your life you've been driven by that. And for me, it was just Tuesday. Do, do you understand the point of that? You thinking about stuff that they ain't studying about. 
Your life has been changed, shifted, transfixed by something that somebody did to you in 1987. And if you told them about it, they wouldn't remember it or you. Walk up to them and say, you know who I am? No, I ain't got no idea who you are. It's because you have made the whole hater genre of the church the most important thing in your life. You ain't got no haters. What you have is a bunch of people who walk around thinking about themselves just like you thinking about yourself. And that's part of what the problem is with the church. Everybody's thinking about themselves, nobody's thinking about the other person, and surely nobody's thinking about the Lord. Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Bless those who curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that use you and persecute you. And yet we got churches running around that feast on the whole idea of they hate you and, and, and don't worry about it because God's going to give you the upper hand and you're going to be able to look down on them. God ain't interested in you looking down on them. It's a false gospel. First of Kings, Second Kings, I can't remember which one. The, the, the story is told of, this is why I didn't want y'all reading the notes because ain't none of what I'm saying now in the notes. Uh, 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 first and second Kings, the, the story is told about some lepers that are sitting outside of a, a, a camp. Uh, in, in the city, there's nothing but pestilence and, 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 and death, and uh, they can't go in because they're lepers, and, and even though the folk are dying, they don't want to be around the lepers. A, a, a little bit farther down from the camp, that's where the enemy is, and the enemy is sacking the city and 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 the, the lepers are talking things over in the middle of the night and somebody raises the question why do we just sit here until we die yeah. if, if, if if we go back into the city they gonna kill us if we go forward and face the enemy they might kill us too but i'd rather go forward and take my chances with the enemy than just sit here and die. And so they get up and they go toward the enemy camp and God miraculously causes them to, to the, the enemy to hear them coming as though it was a, an invading army. They said the, these people have hired a, a, an army to come out and attack us and they ran and they left all their stuff in the enemy camp. So all the lepers have treasure and to spare. And while they're sitting there enjoying the treasure, look, look, looking at all the stuff they got, somebody said, well, what are we going to do with all this stuff? And, and, and one of the lepers said, we're going to take it back and we're going to tell the folk in the city that everything is all right. And somebody said, well, now, wait a minute now. They wanted to kill us, and we're going to take it back to them. And he said, God wants us to take it back to them and let them share in what the Lord has done. And so they went to folk who would have killed them and shared with them the good news of what the Lord has done. That's what the church ought to be preaching. Yeah, there, 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 there are folk who are only out for themselves. That don't mean you have the right to be out for yourself. If and when the Lord blesses you, he has blessed you to be a blessing to somebody else. And I got a problem with the church that preaches capitalism and selfishness and meanness and, 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 and such uh, 
juvenile mess as to tell us that it's okay to hate your neighbor, that, 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 that it's all right to want to prevail over your neighbor. Do you want to know when the church wins? When everybody wins. We, we are not in, in, in a situation where we're trying to beat other people. We are in a situation where we're trying to raise everybody up. Everybody. Those who are with us and those who are against us. Those who like us, those who don't like us. Those who look like us, those who don't look like us. Our job is to raise everybody up. So when, 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 when it says that we are to preach good news to the poor, we are to be proclaimers that God cares about all of us and that God ain't got no favorites. God loves all of us. What does Jesus say to Nicodemus? God so loved the world isn't that what it says? It, it, it doesn't say God so loved Negroes, did it? God, God so loved Caucasoids. God so loved Rome. God so loved Israel. Is that what it says? Pay attention to what's going on right now in world affairs where people are trying to say that God loves one set of people more than another. Find it for me in the scripture. Find, find where it says that only thing, and, and, and don't say that God hates sinners. He doesn't. God hates sin. And so if you are a sinner, God hates the sin that you do. But it doesn't mean that God hates you. And there's another passage in there. Oh, I'm good at finding passages right now. <laughs> there's another passage in there that says, vengeance is mine, says the President of the United States, NATO, the, 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 the Prime Minister of Israel, is that what it says? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. We have to be obedient to what the Lord has told us to do. He has told us to proclaim the good news to the poor, to heal the heart broken. The heart broken. Now, I know that, that Jesus healed physical infirmity. I know that Jesus caused the blind to see and the lame to walk and even raised the dead. But when it says heal the heart broken, that's speaking of something very specific. Speaking of, of, of those who are estranged from God, and because they are estranged from God, there is an emptiness, there is a void in their spirit. And the promise is, as we proclaim the gospel, the void is filled. Not with hate, but with love. Does the church recognize its responsibility, its accountability to love as God loved us? Our love is not to be just reciprocal. That's juvenile love. 
I'm always talking about Parker. Parker takes up all my time now. Uh, 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 Parker comes to my office between services, and I always have something for Parker when he walks in, something to eat. Parker likes to eat. Uh, and, and it's important that I have something for him to eat, because if I have something for him to eat and he sees it, he'll come to me. But if I ain't got nothing for Parker to eat, Parker don't want to be bothered with me. Parker starts looking around to find somebody else who might. Parker often ends up with Reverend Smith over there, because Reverend Smith will give him something to eat if I ain't got it. He'll go and he'll spend all his time with Reverend Emmanuel rather than with me. So I got to make sure I have something in my. Do you know that that's the way a lot of us are? <sighs> Unfortunately, that's true. <laughs> There are some people who only come around when you got something. And they only stay as long as you got it. And the moment you no longer have it, they're, 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 they're through with, with you. And they start looking around for somebody else. Well, that's not the kind of love that Christ showed toward us. Can I help you out with something? We ain't got nothing that Jesus needs. Nothing. We ain't got nothing that we can offer Jesus that Jesus can't take on his own. And so this idea that, 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 that we'll serve Jesus as long as Jesus does what we want him to, to do. That's a lower level of love. That, 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 that's, that's the most basic love that you can have. And God calls us to a higher love. Scripture says, y'all like Paul. Paul says this, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might enjoy the righteousness of God. That's a higher love. And that's what we are called to do. It, it, it's not about healing the physically broken, because even those that Jesus healed, those who who he restored sight to, and he restored hearing to, and he restored the ability to walk to, and that he even raised from the dead. They all died. Physically, they all deteriorated. Ain't none of them here. We, we don't have a personal testimony from anybody who Jesus healed. Do we? So, it's not about the physical healing. It's about the spiritual transformation that takes place when he becomes the Lord of our lives. This is what we have been called to do. And this is where our joy comes from. Last thing I'm going to say. You have joy that comes from receiving what God has given to us. But there is a greater joy that comes from giving to others what God has shared with you. I fear, I, I'm, I'm troubled. And I say this as somebody who loves the church and will always be a part of the church. I, I've, been, I've been a part of the church my entire life. I ain't like some folk who grew up in, there was a period of time when I wasn't in the church and I came back. No, I've been in the church all, all my life. I'm 62 years old. There has never been a time that I wasn't in it. Even before I was baptized, I was in the church, sitting there on the front row, couldn't move, because if I did, I was gonna get in trouble. But, but I, I, I have always been 
in the church. And so when I say this, I say this as someone who loves the church and who wants to see the church become everything that God has placed within the church for it to become. The church has to stop being just a consumer and has to start being a distributor. We're all about consuming. We want, we want, we want. Give me more of this. We sing that stuff. That's, that, that's one word for it. We, we, we sing that and we pray that and we preach that. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. But the church is not about what we receive. The church is about what we give back. Paul didn't go around evangelizing and organizing all of these churches to see what he could get. In fact, he says in more than one place, y'all tried to give me stuff and I told y'all I didn't want it. Because I'm not here for that. I'm here to proclaim Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you what the Lord can do. I, I want to impart his love, his provision, his protection, his power, the knowledge of the divine paraclete into your lives so that transformation can take place and in turn, you can share it with somebody else. When, 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 when we get to the place where we stop thinking about the joy of his coming as being just something for us, and we start thinking like all them folk Jesus healed, and he said, don't tell nobody nothing, and the moment he was out of their sight, they went and told everybody. That's what the church needs to be. I said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I couldn't keep it to myself. That's what the church, that's where true joy comes from. Not just getting, but giving. And, 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 and unless we get to that place, the church will continue to fall short of its potential. All of us are clamoring for an ever-shrinking pie. Y'all know something about making pies, right? Making cakes. You cut it into slices. E e every time you take a slice, there's less cake there. And then folks start to clamor, and they wait till you got down to one slice, and everybody wants to fight over the one slice that's left. That's, that's the state of the church. Fewer people are going to church today than at any time in recorded history. And those of us who are the church are fighting, clamoring, stepping all over folk, trying to get our bigger piece of a shrinking pie. And in the process, we're changing the message of the gospel from one of love and forgiveness and service to gimme, 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 gimme. You next in line for a miracle. Every year, them Pentecostals get on TV and say, 2024, it was 2023, and then it was 2022. This is the year when God's divine favor is going to rest on you. Every year, they, they, they tell the same lie because they're trying to get as many of the shrinking pie as they can get. And I think, and I, and I say this with, with, with a certain degree of humble 
pride. I don't know if that's oxymoronic, but, but I say it with a certain degree of humble pride. Shiloh ain't about gimme. Shiloh ain't never been about gimme. Shiloh is about what can we do to help you? What can we do to help you grow? What can we do to meet your need? What, what ministry can we offer that will help bring wholeness and healing into your life? And I just believe that God continues to bless Shiloh in spite of, because we ain't all about what we can get, but we find joy in what we can give. Yes, sir. Yes. Part of, part of our problem is that we are missing the point of what the joy of the gospel is really all about. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this time of sharing. We pray that what has been said and done here has been pleasing in your sight, edifying to your people, uplifting to your holy and righteous name. As we go, keep us ever in your protective care. In the name of your son, Jesus, we ask it all. Amen. Reverend Smith has the notes. You might actually get something from the notes because it wouldn't have nothing. The very same people are the quickest to try racism at the slightest provocation or for no reason at all. There's no systemic racism. There is no law. There is nothing that says that I can't do something as a black person that you can do. We're honoring all of the great white men who are being smeared and defamed and torn down. I've known Judge Shelley Dick for nearly 30 years, long before she took her seat on the federal bench for the Middle District of Louisiana. I met Judge Dick as part of a five-year continuing dialogue group on race, Sustained Dialogue, that was formed by the Greater Baton Rouge Federation of Churches and Synagogues, now known as the Interfaith Federation of Greater Baton Rouge. From our time together with Sustained Dialogue until now, I have always been proud to say that Judge Dick's perspective on the intersectionality of the law and human rights has been on point. Certainly, this has been true regarding a second majority-minority seat for Louisiana's sixth congressional seat. The judge knows that one-third of six is two. And now, she's moved aggressively to provide relief to suffering inmates at Angola Penitentiary. Monday, Middle District Chief Judge Shelley Dick ordered federal oversight of the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola, saying the prison has continued to violate inmates' constitutional rights by systematically ignoring their medical needs, despite the court's ruling that officials must fix the problem. In April of 2021, some 30 months ago, Judge Dick ruled that state corrections officials have been deliberately indifferent to the medical needs of Louisiana State Penitentiary inmates for decades. Among her supporting evidence, Judge Dick noted that diagnosing one prisoner's cancer took so long that he died before chemotherapy could begin. At that time, Judge Dick offered a 124-page ruling in which she stated that inmate access to health care is unconstitutionally inadequate in the areas of clinical care, specialty care, infirmary care, and emergency care. Diagnoses and treatments are so bad they violate constitutional prohibitions against cruel and unusual punishments. Plaintiffs have satisfied their burden of proving the defendants have been deliberately indifferent to the inmates' serious medical needs in the means and manner of the delivery of health care in violation of the Eighth Amendment to the United States Constitution. The defendants, the state of Louisiana in general, and the state's prison system in particular. While he was campaigning for governor and making sure his name was attached to every frivolous lawsuit brought against the Biden administration, Attorney General Jeff Landry failed to defend the state against these federal charges of cruelty. In fairness, neither did the sitting governor, John Bell Edwards. In 2021, Judge Dick concluded generally that the prison lacks the infrastructure necessary to provide a constitutionally adequate health care system for patients with serious medical needs. 
The prison lacks adequate organizational structure, credentialing and peer review processes, health care policies and procedures, clinic space, and a quality control program. She added that overwhelming deficiencies in the medical leadership and administration of health care at Louisiana State Prison contributes to these constitutional violations. State and prison defendants have been aware of these deficiencies in the delivery of medical care at LSP for decades. Decades. In 1992, a class action lawsuit brought against the Angola prison claimed medical care provided there was constitutionally deficient. A settlement agreement six years later, 1998, required that specific improvements be made to the prison's medical care system, but they were not. In 2021, Dick wrote, given the fact that many of the complaints in this lawsuit and the deficiencies proven at trial are the same as those settled in 1998, the court finds that defendants have been aware of these deficiencies in the delivery of medical care at Louisiana State Prisons for decades. Well, fast forward to this past Monday, and Judge Dick ruled that the federal court will appoint three special masters to develop remedial plans to address the violations and monitor whether they are being followed. This time, her opinion was 104 pages. But again, Judge Dick blasted prison officials for the callous and wanton disregard for the medical care of inmates at Angola. The human cost is unspeakable. The care is not care at all, but abhorrent, cruel, and unusual punishment that violates the United States Constitution. Lawyers for those incarcerated in Angola argued in a two-week remedy trial that little had changed since the judge's ruling two years earlier. About this, Judge Dick wrote, the prison made some changes during the pendency of this litigation, but ultimately defends its health care system and denies that it was constitutionally deficient at any time. Thus, the judge has deemed injunctive relief necessary. Mercedes Montagnes, lead attorney for the plaintiffs, said, humanity does not stop at the prison gate. This court's ruling underscores the value in every life and holds our state accountable for its failure to protect patients. Today, they're vindicated. Jeffrey Dubner, legal director for Democracy Forward, added this, Angola's leadership has had years to fix their practices while our clients suffered needlessly from treatable conditions. This ruling is a win for the rule of law, an important step towards ensuring constitutional care for those imprisoned in Angola, and a tribute to the men who dedicated the last years of their lives to advocating for humane treatment of those in need. The measure of a society is how it treats its weakest members. This quote has been attributed to many, including Mahatma Gandhi and former Vice President Hubert H. Humphrey. But whoever said it, it's a true bellwether for those who call America the greatest nation on the face of the earth. The problems at Angola are not unique to Louisiana. The same can be said of prison systems anywhere in our nation. But Angola is symptomatic of the prison system problems that plague our people, our fathers, sons, husbands, brothers, and the like. Angola is the largest maximum security prison in the United States with 6,300 prisoners, 74% of whom are black. Regardless of their crimes or their punishment, these individuals deserve to be given a modicum of care outlined in the United States and Louisiana constitutions. I'm glad that Judge Dick has taken the judicial steps that she has, and we should pray that instead of defending the indefensible, Louisiana will do the things necessary to reflect our motto, union, justice, confidence. This is something we should pray about. Lord God, in this time of political upheaval, where economic needs take precedence over the provision of quality health care, in this time where systems seek to ignore the medical needs of the incarcerated, we thank you for justices like Shelley Dick and our federal justice system that demands that our government live up to its responsibilities regarding the care provided to our inmates. Like Amos, we ask that you would let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream for the sake of all our people. 
Your word teaches that you detest the use of dishonest scales, but you delight in accurate weights. So we rebuke the spirits of dishonesty, of greed, and injustice within the halls of government, whether it be local, state, or national. And we ask, dear God, that you would make sure that those who have been denied would receive the quality health care that they need. Your word admonishes that everything should be done properly and in order. So we implore you to insist that our state health care system line up with your word now and going forward. We ask these things humbly in the name of Jesus, who is our Christ. Amen.